Hello everybody and welcome to this Work Foundation event where we're going to be looking at the findings from our latest report uh, on the extent to which those with disabilities uh, find themselves in insecure work and really importantly why that matters and what we might be able to do about it. My name is Ben Harrison, I'm director here at the Work Foundation, a policy think tank which is part of Lancaster University. And we're committed to supporting everyone to access well-paid, secure employment. And our current work program is predominantly focused on job insecurity for those who face structural disadvantage in the labor market, as well as the interrelationship between health and work. In terms of the running order this morning, I'm delighted to be joined by my colleagues, Aman Navani and Rebecca Florison, who are gonna be taking us through the findings from our recently uh, released research. We're also going to be hearing from Pazile Hadi, uh, Head of Policy at Disability Rights UK, and she's going to be responding on these issues and where she sees uh, the future of, of government policy to help tackle some of that. And we've got uh, Vicky Foxcroft MP, a Shadow Minister for Disabled People. She unfortunately wasn't able to join us live this morning, but she has sent in some pre-recorded reflections based on the research, which unpacks a little bit about the future direction of uh, Labour Party policy in this area. Once we've heard from our speakers, there'll be time for questions. So through the event, if you do want to ask a question of our panelists, do so through the questions function. I'm gonna be keeping a track of that through the first part of the event. And then when we get into the wider discussion, uh, I can make sure that we raise some of those points uh, with our speakers. But for now, I'll hand over to Rebecca and to Aman to introduce our Insecure Work Program more broadly, as well as our recent research, uh, looking particularly at those with disabilities. Over to you, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Delighted to be here today. Um, yeah, so I'm Rebecca Florison. I'm the Principal Analyst at the Work Foundation, and I've been leading the Insecure Work Program at the Work Foundation. Um, so as Ben was saying, today we're talking about disability, but um, we really started thinking about insecurity back in 2020, around the onset of the COVID pandemic, when things were shifting so much in the labour market. And since then, we've done quite a bit of work. Um, we've looked at gender, we've looked at um, skills, we've looked at interactions with um, the welfare system. And um, we have a lot more work coming up, but we'll talk more about that later. Um, really, one of the biggest things that we've done so far is we've been developing a, um, a broad and very comprehensive understanding of labour market insecurity. So a lot of the times people think about um, zero hour contracts or gig work as kind of these quintessential forms of insecure work. But we are looking at insecurity through the lens of three different ways in which people can experience precarity. The first of which is contractual insecurity. So where people experience, um, where people lack access to, um, uh, where they're not guaranteed future hours or future work. Um, financial insecurity, where people have either unpredictable pay or their pay is too low to get by and uh, a lack of access to important rights and protections, either by virtue of employment status or um, because people lack sort of the, the tenure with a given employer. Now, it's really important that when we look at um, these, these forms of work, they are not necessarily bad forms of work. It's more that for some people, several forms of insecurity come together. And we think that that can have negative consequences on people's lives. So we have mapped indicators uh, of insecurity to these broad dimensions using the labor force survey. And um, we've developed a scale of insecurity where we have people who are in very secure work. So they have no indicators of insecurity. Then we have people who are in low to moderately insecure work um, where people experience one or potentially two forms of insecurity coming together, but they might not necessarily be um, affecting people in any negative way. And then we have a group of people who see um, several forms of insecurity coming together and particularly involuntary forms of insecurity. So that means people who are in involuntary part-time work or involuntary temporary work, meaning that people want to be in full-time work or need to be, and they, they want to be in permanent work, but they are not able to obtain this. And that is the group of people that we term severely insecure. 
Um, and that is the focus of this report as well. Now, it's been really important for us to look specifically at disabled workers because we have we know that disabled workers are um, less likely to be in employment than non-disabled workers. So there is a really big employment gap. But we found out when we published our, our insecure work index last year that disabled workers, even when they are in work, are much more likely to experience severely insecure work. So that is something that we wanted to delve somewhat deeper into. And this became a particular priority during this cost of living crisis, crisis that we're experiencing at the moment. Um, we know that that things have become rapidly unaffordable for many people um, and that insecure workers are really at the forefront of that. They are most likely to be low paid and most likely to, to, to lose their jobs, to be at that risk of job loss. But then disabled workers have the particular issue where they have this additional disability price tag um, where life and services are more um, expensive for you when you are disabled. Um, really over the last year or so we've seen a huge increase in the number of people who are out of work and not looking for work due to long-term sickness and, and health conditions. Um, so there is more than 2.5 million people um, who are out of work and not looking for this reason. But about one in four of those people do really want a job. And that makes it really important that we come to grips with what the experience of work is like for people with disabilities and health conditions. So I will now pass you over to my colleague, research and policy analyst, uh, Aman Navani, who's going to run you through the key findings of this research. Um, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so we're going to go through some of our key findings from our data analysis and then talk uh, about the policy recommendations at the end. So this is our key headline statistic. 27% of disabled workers find themselves in severely insecure work relative to 19% of their non-disabled peers. Disabled workers are one and a half times more likely to be in severely insecure work. And we estimate that there is around 1.3 million disabled people, disabled workers trapped in severely insecure work in the UK. To make sure this result was more robust, we ran a regression analysis where we controlled for other factors that are related to insecure work. And we found that when you control for gender, ethnicity, occupation, and age, this relationship still holds. Uh, we also find that looking at other indicators of insecurity in our index, that disabled workers are also more likely to be underemployed, which means that they are they're more like they like to say that they would like to work more hours. So around 430 disabled people are underemployed. And across the dimensions of our index, we find that disabled workers are more likely to experience contractual and financial insecurity as well. Um, so as a next step, we looked at the potential drivers of this disability insecurity gap. And one key factor here is where disabled people work. So we find that disabled people workers are more likely to work in severely insecure occupations that are low paid. So for example, if you look at the graph of the left, uh, look at the bars on the left hand side, we see that 60% of disabled workers are who are small employers and own account workers, i.e. that they're freelancers, and severely insecure work. The so small being an entrepreneur is inherently insecure, and there's a lot of financial insecurity associated with that. And for disabled entrepreneurs, especially, for example, they might have trouble accessing credit because they might have incomplete work histories. Uh, they might work fluctuating hours, and their ability to work for long hours may differ as well. But we also find that they're more likely to be small employers because having that freedom uh, to manage their own time helps them to manage their condition. If you look at the other end of the occupational spectrum, we see that there is a representation gap where disabled workers are underrepresented in lower and higher managerial professional occupations. So these are occupations like banking, consulting, uh, senior roles such as uh, CEOs, directors, and senior managers. These roles are relatively secure, but disabled workers are underrepresented there. And even though these roles are relatively secure, the disability insecurity gap still exists. 
So for example, we find that 19% of disabled workers in these senior roles experience some form of contractual insecurity relative to 12% of non-disabled workers. So even in these senior roles, the insecurity gap exists, which shows uh, how widespread the insecurity gap is across occupations. We also find that there are some groups of disabled workers who are more likely to be in severely insecure work. Inequalities interact and intersect. So for example, we find that disabled women are more than twice as likely to be in severely insecure work than disabled men. And from our previous research, we find that women do face barriers to secure work. So for example, working mothers are particularly likely to experience a parenthood penalty um, because of a lack of available childcare. Uh, we also find that disabled workers from ethnic minority backgrounds are more likely to be in severely insecure work relative to white disabled workers. So nearly one in three, 29% of black and Asian disabled workers are severely insecure work relative to 26% of white disabled workers. So there is some qualitative research that suggests that disabled workers from an ethnic minority background feel that their job security is based on keeping their disability invisible because of the anticipated discrimination based on their race and disability. So some of them often go to great lengths to minimize their disability so they not be seen as a burden as they do not expect to be supported by colleagues or supervisors. So this is a really troubling finding and our data seems to back it up. Um, lastly, we find that insecurity is related to the type of disability. So for this section of the report, we don't go into some of the mechanisms and drivers of the relationship because we're not specialists in these specific conditions, but we did want to lay out the evidence and add to the evidence base because these findings are quite stark. So for example, 28% of those with mental health conditions are in severely insecure work. Four in 10 autistic workers and those with learning difficulties are in severely insecure work as well. So these are quite troubling uh, results. And what we look forward to sort of, we invite sort of further collaboration on this work. And I think it is a very important uh, avenue for further research. Um, lastly, we make five recommendations in the report and we split them up into some short-term policy recommendations and some long-term ones. So for the short-term policy recommendations, we have, we have called for scaling up of the access to work program. So just to make sure everyone's on the same page, access to work is a discretionary grant that provides financial contributions for the disability uh, related extra costs that working disabled people can face. Uh, so our research has made clear that when it works, access to work can be transformative for disabled workers. However, for too many applicants, barriers remain. So there are huge delays and backlogs in the system, which can sometimes force disabled workers uh, to drop out of work if they don't receive the access to work support that they expect. Um, so we urge the government to uh, resource the access to work program uh, better because it really works for disabled workers and can help them to stay in work and potentially move into secure work in the future. Um, the next short-term recommendation is reforming the statutory sick pay system, which is one of the least generous in the OECD. Uh, for those who do qualify for statutory sick pay, employers only required to pay employees from the fourth day of absence. And many of those in insecure work don't qualify for any sick pay at all because of the lower earnings threshold. Um, so I think that we call for the government to increase the generosity of the system and remove the uh, low earnings threshold so more people can access um, statutory sick pay. In terms of long-term recommendations, it's really important that we improve job security and flexibility for all workers across the board. Um, this will have a disproportionate benefit to disabled workers because they're more likely to be in insecure work. So we have called for the government to strengthen the tests for employment status and shift the onus to organizations to prove that workers are not eligible for employment rights and protections. Because the rights you have is linked to your employee status, so if you're classified as 
an agency worker or any sort of worker as opposed to an employee, you have limited access to employment rights or no access whatsoever, including holiday pay, redundancy pay, for example. Um, so as it stands, the onus remains on workers to undertake legal challenges to change their employment status and secure these rights. So this is uh, sort of unacceptable in our view. In terms of flexible working, we call on the government to make flexible working a day one right. So not a day one right to request, but a day one right to flexible work. So even though disabled workers um, can request flexible working uh, arrangements and because they have rights to reasonable adjustments, um, sometimes they might choose not to share their disability. Um, for those who with recently acquired conditions, they may be uncomfortable in doing so. And so if flexible working is the default option for all workers, then disabled workers can benefit from flexible working without having to share their disability if they choose not to do so. And we encourage employers to uh, explore other forms of flexibility as well, in addition to hybrid or remote working, including job sharing, flexi time and compressed hours as well. Um, next up, we have, uh, it's really important to improve enforcement of labor market regulations as well. So the government needs to increase funding for labor market enforcement and ideally create a single enforcement body um, so I think as it stands now, there are six different enforcement bodies, so it's a very fractured picture. So creating a single body, hopefully, would allow the enforcement body to increase the volume and visibility of the enforcement work, which should boost compliance and serve as a deterrent. So for example, we have, an, uh, in our previous research, we undertook a study of disabled uh, workers and hybrid working, and we find that so many of their requests for reasonable adjustments were rejected. So it's possible that some employers do not fully understand what their responsibilities are towards disabled workers. So in this context, improving enforcement of labor market rights is extremely important. Um, lastly, we call for a reform of pers the personal independence payment. So this call was made in the context of the health and disability white paper that was published during the budget earlier this year. So the government has proposed to scrap the work capability assessment in the benefit system, which is a fitness to work assessment to uh, benefit claimants. And they have uh, indicated they intend to use the personal independence payments as a passport to accessing means-tested disability benefits. So this way, disabled people who are eligible for PIP will now receive a health top-up. However, there are problems with these proposed reforms. So under the current system, if you pass this, the, the work capability assessment and are declared unfit to work, you are protected from work search requirements. However, the personal independence payment is not a fitness to work capability assessment. It's a payment given to disabled people to help them with the extra cost of living. So under this system, uh, work coaches will have more discretion in determining work search requirements. So this is potentially problematic because it would mean that more disabled people would be subject to work search requirements and the threat of sanctions. And so we have called for disabled people who access PIP to be exempt for any, from any work search requirements for the first six months, within the first six months of receiving the benefit. And the idea behind this call is to ensure that disabled people look for work that is appropriate given their skill set and their health condition, because if you are under the threat of sanction, the emphasis is on finding any job um, to avoid that sanction, as opposed to looking for work that will be beneficial um, to you. So that's it from me. Uh, thank you all for listening. Thank you, Aman and, uh, and Rebecca. That's a really great sort of whistle stop tour through um, the research and the recommendations. I'd like to bring in Fazile um, now from Disability Rights um, UK. Um, Fazile, it would be great to get your reflections on the findings that you've just heard from Aman and, and, and Rebecca. The extent to which some of these things resonate with the work that you've been doing at Disability Rights UK and, and, and the sort of the wider landscape as you see it. Thank you, Ben and Rebecca and Aman. Uh, it's, it's so positive that you are taking this long term look at work insecurity and Disability Rights UK um, really uh, appreciates the focus on the insecurity of disabled workers. It, in a way, it, it's so disheartening because I want to be able to celebrate 
that 5 million disabled people are in the workforce. I know we often focus on the disabled people that aren't, but many of us are at work. But this report, your analysis, gives me real pause for thought uh, as to whether we should be celebrating uh, getting into work as a route out of uh, poverty, out of other systemic inequalities that we face. And I think what your work is telling me is that entering the workforce uh, doesn't mean that disabled people are released from the poverty uh, or the other um, discriminations that they face. And, and that's pretty serious. Um, just to dwell a bit about systemic inequality, which I think your report shows there is systemic inequality within the workforce with a quarter of disabled workers uh, finding themselves in insecure work, as Rebecca outlined, financially insecure, worried about their futures, um, not having the rights and protections. You know, these are really serious uh, matters and they're putting a great strain on huge numbers of disabled people. I think Aman said, so 1.3 million. But that's not the only insecurities people are facing. Unfortunately, um, they're facing cuts in public services, which mean that access to vital social care, which might also assist them to go to work, um, are either, uh, they're finding themselves not being able to avail themselves of social care or having inadequate services. And for some people, they do need social care, personal assistance, to get up in the morning, to dress, et cetera, before they're ready for work. So there is a real big link. We're also seeing attacks on transport uh, with ticket office closures. Again, for many disabled people, uh, there is a reliance on public transport. Um, so, uh, and I should also mention lower educational attainment, which might be forcing people into more insecure work. We know that even at GCSE level, disabled students um, do a lot worse. But in terms of degree qualifications, 23% of disabled people have a degree as opposed to 39% of non-disabled people. So you can see that is an incredibly wide gap. So all these systemic inequalities um, interplay with each other to make life a lot, lot harder for disabled people. And as Amon said, much harder for disabled women uh, disabled ethnic minorities. Um, in terms of um, what we do about it, and, and I again say it's really good you put a spotlight on it, um, I think that's really tough. I think I'd just like to say a bit about what I think government should do and then maybe move on to what employers should do now, not waiting for government. I think in terms of what government should do, um, they should really uh, have a bold commitment to halving the disability employment gap, so to get more disabled people into the workplace, but not do that in a way that just means disabled people, as Amon said, are forced to take up um, a low paid insecure work, do that in a way that gives disabled people the best chance of leaving poverty and moving into uh, reasonably paid and um, satisfying roles within the workplace. Um, the government so far has rested on its laurels saying, you know, basically because more disabled people are in the workplace than ever before, but that's not because uh, they've closed the disability employment gap. That's just because more people in the workplace are identifying as disabled, probably as we age and as we're kept in work for longer. Um, the second thing they should do is radically improve employment support um, for people who want to try and get into work. But again, your research has made me think maybe that employment support should be there for disabled people who want to leave insecure work and progress and so that people are given an, a chance to get out of insecure work. Um, we definitely want to see improvements in the access to work scheme, which is abysmal at the moment with 14 week delays and more flexibility and reasonable adjustments. And I'd applaud the right to flexibility on day one um, and even the um, advertising of that, you know, so that people really know that when they do start work, that is their right. 
I think that would be so helpful for all workers, but particularly disabled workers who are balancing um, other aspects of their lives, uh, health conditions, etc., plus struggling with transport, as I've mentioned earlier. Uh, the government could also introduce mandatory um, workforce monitoring so that companies are forced to actually look at uh, the data on where disabled people are in the workforce which would include looking at the pay gap and taking action as they have done with the gender pay gap to try and uh, close the gap by taking um, progressive action. And then um, I think um, finally, I think we, we need to see the government um, using the disability confidence scheme much more boldly to actually require people who want to say that they're members of that scheme to year on year increase the number of disabled employees they have. The government have an opportunity to do all these things. Um, yesterday, uh, they won a ruling, um, a court of appeal ruling, um, saying that the national disability strategy was lawful, which went against the high court decision in January, 2022. The government have no excuse. You know, they really could do these things. Just very briefly, I just say to employers, big organizations and small, you can do so much now. You can begin to monitor your own workforce in relation to disability and the disability pay gap and, and the insecurity issues that we're hearing about today. Um, you can bring in flexibility. There's nothing to stop it. Uh, you can make the reasonable adjustments um, and you can make sure that, um, your disabled staff have development plans and can progress within your workforce. So however um, lacklustre the government's being at the moment, there is nothing stopping organisations tackling this inequality that disabled people face. Thank you. Thank you, Fazila. And, and that's such a, I think, a, a kind of powerful additional reflection there about the role of employers. I, I, once we're into the open discussion, I will definitely come back to, to ask you a little bit more about that, because um, interested to try and understand a, a bit around some best practice in that space. Just finally, before we do um, get into uh, open discussion, we can start um, taking some questions as well. Um, as I mentioned, uh, unfortunately, Vicky Foxcroft MP, the Shadow Minister um, for Disabled People, was unable to join us this morning, but she has sent us some reflections uh, on the research and Labour's wider plans for supporting those with disabilities. Um, so we can play that video uh, now, and, and then uh, once we've heard from uh, Vicky, then we'll open up uh, the conversation a little bit. So uh, I will hopefully, we will see the video appear before us um, very shortly. Here it is. Thank you so much for inviting me to contribute to today's webinar on insecure work. I'm genuinely sorry I, I wasn't able to join you in person but I'm grateful for the opportunity to share my views on this important piece of research. It makes for very sobering, but sadly unsurprising reading. The economic impact of disability is significant. Recent research from Scope has estimated that disabled households need an additional £1,122 per month to have the same standard of living as non-disabled households. Just over 4 million disabled people are economically inactive, 43% of the disabled working age population. And on top of this, the disability employment cap stands at just under 30%. But as this report shows, the difficulties do not stop with getting into employment. Once they're in work, disabled people are faced with a disability pay gap and lack of job security. And the government proudly talks about meeting its target of getting a million more disabled people into work five years early, but many have been pushed into getting any work rather than quality secure jobs. This not only risks their health and financial security, but also damages a wider economy if they are forced to leave the labour market altogether. In 2021 and 2022, I held a series of roadshows with hundreds of disabled people and disabled people's organisations. The biggest takeaway from those sessions 
was the disabled people felt that they were treated as an afterthought by successive conservative governments. And unsurprisingly, work consistently came up as an area in which people continued to face significant barriers. This is something Labour is very keen to tackle if we win the next general election. We will act to close a disability employment gap. We will make disability workforce and disability pay gap reporting mandatory. We also have our fantastic new deal for working people, which will hugely benefit disabled people and those with long term health conditions. It will give everyone the right to request flexible working from day one, with the employers required to accommodate requests as far as is reasonable. It will strengthen our trade unions, which are often invaluable in ensuring disabled members receive their reasonable adjustments. As part of our aim to ensure a secure and safe working environment for everyone, we will put mental health on a par with physical health in our workplaces. We will review provision for stress, mental health, the impact of new technology and materials, and the impact of emerging health and lifestyle issues such as long COVID. We will also raise awareness of neurodiversity in the workplace and across society as a whole. We will raise statutory sick pay and make it available to all workers. And we will reform the access to work scheme to give people in principle indicative awards so they know exactly what support they need and will get in the workplace. And in addition, a future Labour government will guarantee that people who move into work with the help of employment support will be able to return to the benefits they were on before without the need for another lengthy assessment process. We will also look at in detail at reforming the much criticised disability confidence scheme and reasonable adjustments to make it easier when someone changes jobs. But we also know that the problems don't begin and end in the workplace. Our whole society needs to change. This is why I'm working with my Shadow Cabinet colleagues to ensure that we fix the social care crisis, that people have suitable homes for life and that we have a truly accessible transport system. Lastly, and most importantly, co-production with disabled people, the experts by experience will be at the heart of everything we do. Thank you once again for inviting me and I hope that you have a productive session. Excellent. So that um, was uh, a, a series of reflections that we had from uh, from Vicky Foxcroft, the Shadow Minister for Disabilities. I'm also really pleased to say that we've been joined. We weren't quite sure whether um, uh, the schedule would allow for it, but we have been joined um, by Sir Robert Buckland MP, um, who will uh, you'll have seen has appeared on our screens. And, and Sir Robert has recently begun an autism employment review on behalf of the government. So we're very grateful, um, Sir Robert, that you've been able to join us this morning. Um, we've been discussing um, the, the latest research from the Work Foundation, looking at the extent to which those with disabilities find themselves in insecure work. Yeah. One of the findings from our work was that one in three of those with autism find themselves in insecure forms of, of employment. So it's fantastic you could join us. Could you perhaps say a little bit more about the focus of your review and, and, and how colleagues can perhaps support and, and get involved? Yeah, well, well, thank you very much. And thanks for having me this morning. And uh, really good to join uh, quite a big crowd online to talk about what an issue that is not just of moral importance, but of economic importance to the uh, health of our country more generally. And, you know, you hear politicians talk about productivity and about the wider economy and about economic inactivity. What they actually mean is that people's lives are being affected by the obstacles that they often face when it comes to recruitment and then retention in work. And I'm not just talking about people who might have a diagnosis of autism, but for many people who uh, are, are already in our workplace or might, might not be in the workplace, who don't have that diagnosis, but for whom reasonable adjustments would be appropriate. And I think that 
you know, the more I look at this, the more I th I'm moving away from an idea that somehow uh, we should, uh, you know, put autistic people into a box and say, oh, we need a load of special provisions for them. What we actually need to be doing is changing the whole culture generally. So uh, the way in which interviews are conducted, the way in which applicants are allowed to prepare for interview should change across the board. So instead of asking, having to ask the question, do you have a disability? Are you autistic? Instead, be much more based upon what needs, uh, uh, you know, do people want out there? There. What, what are the requirements? What, what, what would make, uh, you know, what adjustments would make the process a better one and a more accessible one? And, and what, how do employers adjust their own uh, practices and behaviours to embrace and accommodate far more potential from the workforce? And therefore, my uh, review is very much targeted on those issues of recruitment and retention and focused not always on the autistic person, but on the employer, on the economy, on industry, on the wider implications as to what all of us can do better in order to really realise the potential of autistic people. Uh, and we've asked a series of questions in the review, uh, which we're getting a lot of answers on. We, we've done a targeted call for evidence, uh, which means that a lot of people who are already knowledgeable in the field are bringing forward their ideas and their evidence. And of course, I'd encourage more uh, colleagues on this call to do the same by uh, using the links that we can provide uh, if uh, uh, colleagues don't have that. Um, uh, and then the aim is to produce a report later in the year with some really crunchy conclusions that we expect government to respond to swiftly in order to help uh, industry and the wider economy make that change. And here's the thing, I don't re review, uh, view the review as the, as, the, as the end, it's the beginning of a process, because what I want to see is an element of accountability in all of this, how we measure progress, and how we see the, this alarming figure of less than three in 10 autistic adults in employment start to rise up to at least the disability average of five out of 10, and who knows, even more. So, um, you know, I, I'm not ashamed of having a deep ambition. I think a lot of people on the call know that I'm a parent of an adult, an autistic adult myself, uh, and therefore, like with millions of other people, uh, you know, this is a lived experience that I want to try and use to the benefit of wider society. So would really love your input. Uh, as I said, we'll make sure that if people don't have the links, then my colleagues at DWP can provide that. And uh, we'd love to hear from you over the summer. Thank you. Fantastic. Th thank you, Sue. I, I, I know you've got a very busy schedule this morning. Are you able to stay with us for the rest of, of the session this morning? I can stay for a bit. How long is the session? Um, we, we close at 11. Um, so I've got about 20 minutes left. It's okay. absolutely no problem at all if you do need to if you do need to drop off the call. I'll stay for as long as I can, Ben. And then uh, if there's any follow ups, please, please let me know. And I'll make sure that Stephen and the team at DWP are able to help with any specific queries. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you. Uh, Aman and Rebecca, I'll, I'll invite you to turn your cameras back on now as well, because we'll try and cover off some of the questions that we've that we've had from uh, colleagues who are watching and listening um, this morning. Um, and, and so uh, one which is very easy that I can kind of uh, uh, cover off immediately is, yes, we are recording the session this morning. We will share it with everybody and we can share uh, the research report again with all with all attendees. Um, I do just want to um, pick up on a couple of questions that we've had um, from Stuart Harrison, who's, who's particularly asking around the experience of um, deaf people um, in, in the workplace. Aman and Rebecca, I think I know the answer to this, that, that that wasn't necessarily a particular condition that we've done lots of focused work on, but just in case that it, it is and it, and it didn't feature heavily in the report, if there is anything from, from your side on, on that, um, that would be great to hear. Um, Aman, is, is, is there anything that you can respond to Stuart on that? Yeah, I mean, unfortunately, we couldn't go down to that level of details. The question we used in the LFS was asking respondents what their main health condition was, but because the sample size for those with hearing difficulties was so small, we weren't able to report the findings. So we weren't able to disaggregate to that extent. But I mean, obviously, it remains an important question. Yes. So I, I think on that one, Stuart, we, I mean, we'd, we'd love to connect more around that and, and, and see if there are particular um, uh, ways in which we might get under the skin of some of that. But Fazila, is it something which perhaps in the work that you've done at Disability Rights UK that, that you might have some reflections on? I, my reflection would be to very much um, support what Sir Robert was saying about um, not 
so much focusing on impairments, but focusing on how we need to change the workforce and the culture and, and just take inclusion as a given. And I think we have such a great opportunity at the moment with uh, worker shortages in the UK, uh, with our experience of hybrid and remote working having been um, kind of escalated because of the pandemic uh, and because of, of workers wanting greater flexibilities. And I'd really agree with Sir Robert, you know, let's open up the recruitment process. Let's not be so formulaic. Let's, let's assess people in different ways that suit them so that they can bring out their skills and their talents. You know, let's not just keep on with the sort of standard forms and the interviews in very rigid ways. And we can do so much to sort of open up work. We've got so much opportunity at the moment. I, I, there may be, there have been issues with um, deaf sign language users, particularly with the access to work scheme kind of capping costs. But I think those have been resolved. But um, I don't know anything more specifically about uh, the issue of deaf and hard of hearing people in the workplace. What you were reflecting on there, Fazila, around um, the, the role of employers, you mentioned this in, in as the final um, part of, of, of your set of reflections, that actually there's a lot that employers can be doing more broadly out with future government reform. I just wondered whether you had in mind some, some particular examples of best practice or, or, or sort of particular areas of focus that employers should be looking at. I mean, we, we know already that one of our biggest employers, the NHS, has workforce disability monitoring. It's been doing it for years, and I'm not, I'm not saying it hasn't got a long way to go in including disabled people in the workforce, it has, but it is monitoring, it's monitoring recruitment, progression, harassment, discrimination, grievance procedures, uh, where people are in the bandings, etc. That can be done by employers. I, I know that the bigger employers, uh, I would urge them to get on and do that without government asking them to. Um, also, I think flexibility and adjustments, why wouldn't employers want to offer those as long as the, they're monitoring the outcome of what they want from the role? What does it matter to them uh, how people choose to deliver that role and those outcomes? So I think employers could really look at that and, as I say, look at their recruitment processes and their processes for developing disabled staff, because as your research found, uh, many of us are languishing for far too long, the lower rungs of the ladder in very insecure employment. But what can employers do to recognise where their companies are doing that to people and, and take action to stop that? So I think there's, there's so much with the right leadership employers can do. Yeah. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Um, so, Robert, we've had a couple of questions around the access to work um, uh, programme and, and, and process. Um, and, and in particular, thinking about the, the fact that um, many are calling for reforms uh, of it. There's a couple of particular questions around the best way of approaching colleagues in DWP around that or, uh, to, to ensure that any changes are, are done in a, in, a, in a way where they're co-produced co yeah, and the extent yeah. to which this can be better promoted to employers as well. Yeah, look, some great questions there about co-production. You know, nothing about us without us is what I always say. And this review is being really guided and informed by autistic people themselves. You know, it has to be if it's going to be relevant and if it's going to make sense. Um, although I don't have a specific brief to reform access to work, it's coming up as a, as a big topic a, a lot of the time, mainly the delay that often happens between the initial application and then the final uh, recommendation, which, of course, can be really difficult if you're in, in a fluid labour market. Um, so um, I, I think the short answer is without, you know, uh, I'm not a minister and I can't hold forth for the government, but I know that the civil servants in the DWP are very keen to be influenced by autistic and people in the wider impairment and disability community in terms of making sure that the program is 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 is, is working properly and, and you know if there are further ideas and, and proposals for adjustments then I think they are relevant to the ambit of my inquiry and I'd like to hear about them and I'm sure DWP colleagues would as well. Fantastic thank, thank you Sir Robert. Um, 
In, in terms of um, thinking about uh, a, a different kind of employment setting where, where those with disabilities are in, in self-employment, Aman, this was something which, which you raised through the course of, of, of your presentation. That obviously sort of presents particular elements of, of insecurity, but th there's a sort of trade-off going on here, isn't there, between the flexibility that many of those with disabilities look for in, 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 in their role. And that can be beneficial. Can you can you maybe just unpack a little bit about some of the risks that are involved with being in in, in self employment that, that those with disabilities might face? Absolutely, and I think you're absolutely right about this trade off, this tension between disabled people trying to manage their condition and looking to advance in their careers. And I think this trade off is particularly acute when you're self employed, as you said. Sort of many disabled people can opt into self employment as a way to managing their condition, but there are downsides. So, for example we found that disabled entrepreneurs can have trouble accessing credit. Uh, if they have incomplete work histories prior, uh, they might not have sort of savings to fall back on if they sort of their venture doesn't work out. And I think so there, there are unique challenges with being self-employed, um, especially when there's a recession or an economic downturn, they're particularly exposed to sort of fluctuations in the business cycle. So there is that trade-off there and it's incumbent on us as sort of policymakers employers um, to make sure across the occupational uh, spectrum we deal with that trade-off so that disabled workers can opt into these forms of flexible working but at the same time that doesn't harm their future uh, career prospects. Fantastic thank you thank you Aman. Uh, so Robert we've, we've had another question which has been raised through the course of the conversation this morning looking uh, at the reform to personal independence payments and, and I suppose the broader engagement with the welfare system and I suppose you know we know there are concerns that uh, although actually the, the, the sort of reform is welcome the idea that that might increase um, conditionality um, within the welfare system for those with disabilities is a cause for concern for, for many. Has that come up within the course of, the re of your review so far? Do you have reflections on that? Um I mean, no, it, it won't be within the ambit of the review, but I understand why uh, colleagues want, want to work about, about the interoperability of PIP. I mean, my view about PIP is that it is relate, related to the disability to the need. It's not related to income and it should not be related, in my view, to, uh, you know, the work somebody does because it's a separate assessment. All right, but you know, we, we we all know if you're on a higher rate of PIP, then it may well be you know your your ability to do uh, you know full time job might be significantly impaired, or might you might not be possible at all. But but the whole system of PIP has to be based upon a different set of criteria based upon the scale and level of the need uh, according to the disability and, and i think you know that principle is really very very important and it's often misunderstood i think by people out there who seem to think you know some people even think it's an income related benefit which we know it you know, you know it's not and it should not be bearing in mind the particular criteria upon which it is set so so in my view i think that um, you know, more generally in terms of benefit, I'm encouraged to hear the government looking at much more flexible ways in which you can avoid the cliff edge of so many hours a week and then you lose all your benefit entitlement, as opposed to a mixed economy where you might be still getting some uh, benefits and, and then, of course, uh, enjoying a, a job as well and enjoying the benefits that employment and the fulfillment that employment can bring to so many people. So so I, th I think as long as people understand the parameters, of the different types of benefit and what they're for, then I, I, I think we should embark upon this journey and work out ways in which we can uh, stop the disincentives to employment that clearly at the moment exist within the benefit system. So, so uh, although it's not within strictly within the remit of my review, obviously I'd be interested to you know hear the lived experience of people as as to how they feel that that you know the, the current system might be an obstacle to them getting a full time or even a part time job. Fantastic, thank you for that. Fazila, do you have thank any you. reflections on that? Yes, thank you. I did want to come in there. I mean, <laughs> I agree with Sir Robert that, you know, PIP is an extra cost benefit. It's non-means tested. Uh, I think uh, our view at Disability Rights UK is that it, it's totally inappropriate to use it as a gateway uh, to an additional health component of universal credit. Because PIP isn't about whether you can work or not. And whilst disabled people um, are pleased to see the capability assessment go, we are not pleased to see no assessment being put in its place and disabled people being left to the discretion 
of thousands of work coaches who could have different conversations and uh, end up in different places and indeed uh, end up imposing sanctions on disabled people who actually uh, can't work or have limited capability for work. So actually we, we are very opposed to there being no assessment framework uh, to judge whether people can work. Um, and we, we really do oppose PIT being used as a, a gateway benefit. So let's see, I mean, the new, the, the, the government is doing some work now looking at the detail of how their proposals in the white paper can be implemented and perhaps they'll modify some of their thinking and perhaps there will be an assessment framework uh, so that disabled people know the rules and can appeal where they think the uh, work coach has got the decision wrong. But at the moment, it's kind of going to be the Wild West out there. Just while, while you sort of um, uh, have, have the floor for Zelo, I'm conscious we also heard from, from Vicky Poxcroft before um, Sorbet joined us. I wondered whether you had any reflections on what you heard from, from the Labour shadow uh, minister for disability. Yeah, I, I was pretty pleased actually. I, I'm very, I'm going to use that recording definitely to hold them to account on all those issues. It sounded pretty <laughs> bold, like they would take some uh, steps that, you know, like, you know, uh, she, she, seem to want to close the disability employment gap and um, improve access to work, introduce mandatory workforce uh, monitoring around disability and pay gap monitoring, uh, increase flexibility. So yeah, uh, you know, good things. Are, and um, yeah, I'll wait to see what actually goes into their manifesto, but on the face of it, uh, there were some, uh, some uh, interesting and positive things there. Fantastic. I'm, I'm conscious of time and we've got a lot of questions, more than I'm going to be able to get through. So just to say to everybody, if we don't manage to cover off the thing that you've asked about, we will endeavour to do that after after the session. Um, so uh, we will find a way to, to, to do that. But in the time we've got left, Amanda, there is one question which has been asked around the kind of relationship between mental health and insecure work. So and, 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 and the, the, the sense which actually being in insecure work can actually make your mental health worse and I know it's very difficult to sort of pinpoint the exact causal relationship there but I just wondered if in the course of the research you had any reflections on that. Yeah absolutely I think there is a cyclical uh, impact where sort of if you are an insecure work your mental health can deteriorate which in turn makes it more difficult to get out of that cycle and into more uh, secure work. I think when you're interacting with the benefit system as well uh, these work capability assessments and the assessment system in general can be high stress and very stressful and high stakes and sort of just interacting with the benefit system can lead to deterioration in mental health and increased anxiety. So I think there are sort of long-term sort of uh, negative mental health effect, effects as well um, due to a period in insecure work and I think that's something we're going to take a closer look at in the future. Fantastic. Can, can I come in there for a of second? Of course, Rebecca, yeah. No, and that's that's totally right and I think there is sort of an unhelpful cyclicality there in the sense that uh, people with mental health conditions are more likely to be in insecure work and then insecure work is likely to then affect your mental well-being. Um, so, so they're sort of an unhelpful way in which people kind of get sorted into those um, positions. We have heard, well, we have previously been in contact as well with the Money and Mental Health um, uh, Policy Institute. They do a lot of interesting work about that, which touches on a lot of the work that we do in the sense that insecurity is often really accompanied by low pay and financial insecurity. And it's often that financial insecurity, which has a huge impact on people's worry, on people's stress levels, um, and which kind of just feeds into those, those mental health conditions. Yeah, that's really helpful. Thank you, Rebecca. Um, in the final couple of minutes that we've got, um, I just wondered um, whether we might sort of cast ourselves, sort of gaze forward a little bit and think about within within the sort of breadth of issues that we've talked about, um, where where each of you might want to see um, the next government really focus to try and to try and turn around some of the issues that we've been talking about, um, and what what perhaps what the one big policy intervention. Um, I know that there are many, but but if one had to kind of identify the most important, what that might be to try and turn around some of this. Um, Fazila, I'll, I'll, I'll start with you if that's okay. Where, where should the next government really focus to try and tackle some of this insecurity that we see those with disabilities um, facing in the labour market? 
Well, that's a, a really different question, a difficult question. I don't know if there's a sort of silver bullet, but thinking of the recommendations today, I think I'd I'd probably start with um, something around mandatory workforce monitoring, because I think we need to keep these issues visible so that we can do something about them. I know that seems a little bit passive, but I think until we begin to really see the evidence annually from employers, uh, I think this issue will be concealed. Absolutely, that, that's great. Thank you very much, Fazila. Um, uh, Aman and Rebecca, uh, where, where would you go to with that? I, uh, clearly, that reporting element is going to be very, very uh, key, but are there other areas that you would want to see the next government focus on? If I can start that off. Um, I think we've talked a lot today about sort of rights and entitlements that people have and where they uh, maybe miss out on some of that. But I think it's also really, really key that we enforce people's existing rights and protections. And I think this is something that is really, um, really weak in the UK. So our report makes a recommendation, which is that we'd like to see more um, just inspectors, more people going into workplaces and seeing exactly what is going on there. Um, and we would really like to see government take forward um, the the plan that they had to build a single enforcement body. So to bring together those very sort of fragmented bodies of labour market enforcement into a single whole that will be better coordinated and better able to tackle some of those huge issues. Thanks, Rebecca. Aman, I'll give you the final word. Um, I think I would go for sort of making sure more disabled people are not subject to work search requirements. I think that's really important because being subject to conditionality and the threat of sanctions is a huge driver of insecure work for everyone who interacts with the welfare system. And I think the question is with the scrapping of the work capability assessment, as Fazila said, so the question is sort of how do you determine conditionality and how do you protect disabled workers from increased conditionality? And I think that's a key question uh, going forward. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Aman. So I think that just about brings us to a close in terms of the conversation this morning. I just want to say a huge thank you to all of our panellists for their contributions and to all of you for attending, but as well the organisations that have helped support us in this research, providing their time and, and, and expertise uh, in doing so. We're very, very conscious at the Work Foundation that we want to work collaboratively with partners across all of the work that we do, but particularly in areas such as this, where we know that um, there's such a breadth of experience and expertise outside of our organisation and that the work benefits from. So we're very grateful for, for the time that organisations have, have, have given us in uh, helping to produce this work. And we're going to be continuing to work in this space over the coming months and into next year. We've got a, a long term project that we're working on with the Nuffield Foundation and colleagues at Lancaster University uh, regarding the experiences of those with disabilities and long term health conditions uh, and hybrid working. Uh, and there'll be an ongoing blog series expanding on this research that we've been talking about today. Uh, if you'd like to know more about that or, or get involved, uh, then please do um, get in touch. And we've got new research being published next week as well, looking at the factors um, which shape the choices that individuals make in the labour market, and in particular, why people opt into insecure work. And clearly a lot of the things that we've been talking about uh, this morning are very, very relevant in that regard. All of our research and events are free uh, to access, and, and the best way of, of not missing out on them is to sign up to our newsletter, which you can find a link to on our website. For now, though, thank you once again. I hope you found the discussion valuable uh, and enjoy the rest of your day.